Okay, so that's the end of the configuration. Um, now we're going to make the LFS system bootable. Um, and when we get to the grub bit, this is where it gets a little bit complicated and I'll start to veer away from the book because of the fact that this is a Mac we're dealing with. Um, so I'm going to have to keep a clear head there to make sure that um, keep um, an idea of what I'm doing and just be careful. It's um, a little bit involved. So let's carry on with making the LFS system bootable. And the first thing we're going to do is to edit the FS tab or create the FS tab file and edit it. So if we look at what we've got at the moment, just for reference, we've got um, on the SDA, we've got a 200 megabyte EFI file system. So the Apple needs that and we will be using that to boot using EFI. We've then got the Apple file system, which we will eventually be getting rid of, but for now it's going to be uh, retained while we're getting the LFS system up and running. Um, we've also got our root system that we've been installing on, which is SDA3, so that's something we need to remember. I'll just make a note of that. SDA3 to save me having to keep referring back. And we've also got SDA4, which is the swap. So SDA1, SDA3, and SDA4 are the three partitions that we need to add information about to the file system tab. However, having said that at the moment, there's no mention of the EFI. So for the time being, we're just going to add in the file system and the swap um, partitions. So let's do that now. VI ETC FS tab. And you can see that the top two lines it's got uh, ready for us to just fill in. So let's do the root file system first. And if you remember, I said that was dev SDA3. So we'll press I for insert SDA3. And the type we set that to was an EXT4 when we formatted it right at the very beginning. And then the swap partition, if you remember, that was SDA4. And that's all we need to alter. The rest of it's all been done for us. We don't need to change anything with the rest of it. So let's save that. Um, there's a bit there about uh, if you use EXT3 um, and about making it reliable across power failures. Um, we're using an EXT4, so we don't need to worry about that. So now we go on to the Linux kernel, and this will take a few minutes to build, because uh, what I'll do is um, I'll build a default kernel, which I only do for these demos, actually. I'll, I'll keep custom kernels for all my machines, and um, I have been intending to do a video on... on um, building a custom kernel and there's various advantages to doing that and the main one is that it's quicker to compile and probably the secondary one is that the kernel itself is a lot smaller uh, because of that it's you're not com compiling in stuff that you're never ever going to use um, but for now until I do that video for now it's it's easiest and it's less error prone if um, I'll just show you how to build uh, a generic kernel. So let's extract the kernel. And so this is quite a huge file. When it's extracted, it's um, roughly about a gigabyte, I think, in size, all the source files. OK, so that's done. So the first thing we do, as it's got here, is to clean the source directory. Um, it's recommended to do this. Then it says uh, several ways to configure the kernel options usually. This is done through a menu driven interface uh, like this and so on. Now what I normally do here first is you can run a target with make called make def config and what that does that sets up a very sane 
set of configurations with default settings. Um, and when it's done that, you can see it's actually created a, a configuration based on a generic 64-bit uh, Intel processor. When you've done that, then it's a good idea to run make menu config. And this is the point where I said if you've got a terminal that's less than 80 characters in size, you'll get an error message there and it won't run. So you'll have to resize your terminal to at least 80 columns across to allow um, the menu to work. So some notes and information there about configuring the kernel. Um, it suggests they're using make def config there actually. Um, it would have probably been better if it mentioned that before using make menu config, but there you go, it wouldn't make particularly much of a difference. Um, and it says the only thing really to check is these settings here. So as you can see, it's indented to show the levels of the menus. First one we need to go to is device drivers, which starting as a top where we've just landed, um, we go down to down here where it is device drivers, press enter. And then we look for ones called generic driver options. So you can see generic driver options indented slightly. So that's just here, press enter. And then we want to make sure an option called support for you event helper is not checked. Well, there it is there, the first one, no star in it. And then maintain a dev tempfs file system to mount a dev. Make sure that's checked and you can see it is already checked. So that's it. So that's the only thing we need to check. We will need to make some other settings for UEFI as it says here. Um, but for now we can build this. Um, we could go straight into the um, UEFI bit. In fact, I might do that actually, save so having to run the build twice and do all these commands twice. Um, so basically the next thing we need to do after our configurations is to build the kernel. But if I go into the, where is it now? Oh yes, this is it. We need to go to the BLFS page. This is the Beyond Linux from scratch to build in um, Grub for the boot process. So we're getting a little bit out of order here. Um, yeah, this is the same link, isn't it? This grub tab that I kept up. Not quite right, okay. So let me get rid of this. Um, now I got to this link from that grub page, which was part of the LFS book. That's taken me to the grub, which is in the BLFS book now. Um, but we actually, if I go up, we actually need to do something even before this one. So it's probably easier if I, yeah, take, let's do this from, uh, I'm just trying to think the best way to do this now. Yeah, let's, let's, do, let's do this straight from the top of the BLFS books. If I go back to the Linux from scratch homepage. Now instead of going to LFS like we have done before, we're going to go to BLFS. We're going to read it online as before and we're going to accept the latest stable version 11.0. And what we need to do here is to go down and it's probably easiest to do a control F and find EFI. And this is the ones, these are the packages we need to boot here. You can see we we're just in that page. Um, and we had that page up as well, but there's two other packages that need to be installed before that. So what I should do is I'm going to come out of the kernel configuration for now. There was no changes to make, or we didn't make any changes, so it hasn't asked me if I want to save any. I'm going to go back to sources. I'm going to make a directory called BLFS because I'm creating BLFS packages now. And I'm going to start building these four or go through these four parts of the BLFS book 
to build what we need for your EFI booting. So I'll start with this EFI var and what we'll have to do is we'll have to use our other terminal to download these because we haven't got any method or any easy method of downloading within the true environment. So I'm going to become the root again. So we're just in the normal root environment for our live CD, live, live environment. We'll go to MNT LFS sources, BLFS, and then I'm going to fetch the files from here that we need to complete this. So I'll right click this, copy the link, center click it here. There's a patch there as well I noticed, so I'm going to download both at the same time, so I'll put a space in, right click this and copy the link again, center click it and then press enter and that will fetch the tarball as well as the patch that we need. So now we can follow the instructions here to um, install this package. Now in BLFS it's less a, less prescriptive, it's not a recipe that you've got to follow exactly, um, it's more about making some options or choosing some options yourself about how um, you want to install the various packages within Beyond Linux from scratch. So what you'll find is there's some command explanations here and some of them there'll be command explanations that don't refer to anything up here and that's because they're optional. Um, so for example um, we've got this command here make with the C flag set um, it explains what that does um, and there's also libda here for uh, assignment for this install there may be other options here that don't actually appear here and, and you might decide oh yes you want to um, alter that for this particular package there isn't anything like that but for the UAFI part I recommend you just follow the standard um, instructions that are in these boxes unless unless you're really sure you, you want to uh, diverge from the standard installation. So let's extract this package EF5R oh sorry not here in this window here because we want to do this in the true environment not in the live environment and first of all we'll apply the patch and then we can build, so this will override our C flags which is what we want, you don't want as it says here um, oh sorry this is about the test suite I'm sure it says somewhere oh no it may be grub actually, it warns you about setting C flags um, which may prevent the package being built correctly so um, it could be the same for this EF5R as well. I'm not going to mess around trying to optimize this. Just accept what they've tested uh, with these two switches here. So that's built OK. We can now install that. And that's done. So let's tidy up now. EF5R37. next package is EFI boot manager so there's only one link oh right now this has got two requirements so what that means is as the dependency is an environment we've got to install popped first of all before we install this um, it doesn't say it's a runtime environment so it's obviously an install dependence sorry runtime dependency it's obviously an install dependency so we've it's imperative that we install this first so what I've done is I've sent a click that link to get another tab up and we've got the details for installing popped here. There's an optional package just for generating documentation which we don't want so I'm just going to copy this link, go back to the other terminal, again wget, center paste that link, center click that link, paste it in, fetch it go back to these two terminals and start the installation so extract popped change into the directory now also another thing in BLFS they chain commands together with this ampersand ampersand and it basically means if uh, the configurable command failed then the make wouldn't run so it's quite convenient to get things moving uh, you can 
do several things at once without having to type in or sit there waiting for one command to finish and start another one off. So it's quite safe to do. So you see it's configuring now it's gone on to the make automatically and it's finished so it's run both those commands automatically. Um, if you've got Doxygen installed you wish to build the API documentation we're not doing that. Let's run the tests. Yep that's fine. Let's install it and if you built the API documentation we didn't so we can just skip past that and close that tab down and go back to EFI Boot Manager. Remove the pop source and now we're going to go back to the other terminal and download this package. Same as before. Now we'll extract it and install it. So we've got a set command first of all. Then we build it. and install it and that's done and you can see the explanations here it's telling you what the various parameters are now we move on to grub so if you remember we skipped grub before because we were going to come here to install it in a different way um, which is required for UEFI, there's several additional steps and different configurations. So let's start by downloading it. So once again wget, there's another file there to download, which is font data. And then we've got the required runtime dependency, EFI boot manager, so we've just done that. And a recommended one free type so it's recommended let's do that as well we'll do that first uh, so we need to do some more downloads copy link and there's another one there for additional documentation so let's grab that as well always useful to have documentation lying around and this has also got some recommended dependencies um, to be quite honest for purely for grub it's not worth bothering with these recommended de dependencies um, I would only install these if you really wanted to or if you really have a reason to they're, they're not needed for um, booting grub So it looks like the either my internet has gone down again or there's a problem there. Let me see if it is the internet or not. it's not the internet so that link it looks like is um, out of date all right it's actually downloaded that's okay right so let's now extract free type And we've got the documentation, so if you've downloaded it and you want to install it, just run this command. If you didn't and you don't, or you don't want to install it, just ignore that command and carry on. We copy all of this safe in the knowledge that they've all been chained together, these commands. So as long as the make completes successfully, we know that all the prior commands succeeded. Uh, 
Yep, that looks okay. We can install it. There's no test suite. And if you did download the optional documentation, you need to run these commands as well. And that's done. Okay, so now we can shut this tab down, go back to Grub, and we need to actually extract Grub from the directory. I'm going to do it here. Um, actually, no, I think I can go back. I don't think there's any other packages from BLFS. So extract Grub. And as it says here, on certain environment variables which may affect the build. So let's do that. Um, oh, let's do this first. Sorry, installation grub. Right. Yes, I should have stayed in the BLFS. Um, I'll move it there actually because it's using a file we've downloaded. So I'm going to move the grub directory into BLFS, then go into BLFS, then into grub again, and now this command will work. It wouldn't have worked before because it wouldn't have been able to find this file that we've downloaded. There you go, that's worked. Now I'm going to unset the all the flags that might be set, C flags, CXX flags, etc and configure and build the package. Yeah, so just an explanation about the flags. It's happened to me loads of times before. I've compiled Grub with optimization and wonder why Grub's either not booted or it's half booted and not worked and it is um, just too much optimization. It's a critical program as it's booting the machine, so best just to accept the defaults. Okay, that's all built correctly. There's no test package, so let's just install it. Um, it does say you can leave out free type, but you may miss something in at an initial boot. That explains it there. Um, and it's got a link here to configure it, which is the last bit we're going to go into now. Um, it says about creating emergency boot disks. I guess this is interesting from a point of view of knowing how to create one, but I always find that necessary because we've booted from a live image anyway, so I guess it's also useful if you've not booted from a live image uh, to have a separate boot disk, but I've, I've never done this, but if you wish to do this, uh, it's yeah up to you. So this is a bit where we need to go back and uh, check the kernel settings. So I'm going to remove the grub directory we've created, back down to sources into the Linux directory and back to where we were originally. Make menu config and you'll see we're going to and fro a little bit here because they're uh, quite closely related. We need certain kernel settings to enable UEFI to build um, so that's why I'm swapping backwards and forwards here. So same as before, we just 
go down, start with each of these top level options and then just work our way down. So the first one is processor type and features. So go into that and we want EFI runtime service support. So just look down for that. There it is there, EFI runtime service support is checked and EFI stub support is also checked. Um, EFI mixed mode support, you can probably turn that off. If you look at the help, um, well for a start it says if you're unsure, say no. Um, but also it says enabling this feature allows a 64-bit kernel to be booted on 32-bit firmware, uh, provided your CPU supports 64-bit mode. So everything we're doing is 64-bit, so that's not really needed. We can remove that. So now let's go back to the top level, and the next one we want is firmware drivers, which is here. So scroll down there, and then EFI support, which is that option there. We press enter there. Then we want EFI variable support via, via SysFS to be blank, so we remove that one. And export EFI runtime maps to SysFX, SysFS, that's the next one. And we do want that checked, so we'll leave that one as it is. So exit and exit again, back to the top. The next main menu option we need is enable the block layer, which is that option. Then partition types. And then we want advanced partition selection, which brings up all these other options. And we want to ensure that EFI GUID partition support is set, which it is. So that's fine. Again, back up to the top. And we go down to device drivers. Then we want graphic support, which is a few lines down. There it is there. Then we want to look for frame buffer devices, which is somewhere down the bottom, I think. Yep, there it is. Then support for frame buffer, buffer devices, just presenter again. Then we want to ensure that EFI base frame buffer support is set, which is that one there. So it is set. Then we go back up one, back up another one, and we want to look for console display driver support, which is just there. And check that from, uh, frame buffer console support is checked. Yes, it's already force checked. We can't remove that one with the dashes around it, so that's fine. Exit again to the top. Last one we need is file systems, pseudo file systems which is near the bottom, I think. Yep, there it is. And we want to make sure the EFI variable system support. So it's currently a module. Um, I prefer to build things in, so I'm just going to press spacebar there to build that in. Um, and we can exit that now. Exit to the top, exit again. Because we make changes, it says, do you want to save your new configuration? We take the default yes. And that's the Linux kernel configured now. So the rest of that is about uh, creating the EFI system partition. Um, let's see which way around this is the best way to do. Uh, I think if we yeah I think if we finish installing um, let's get back to where this was yeah so we've done that bit if we finish installing the kernel that's probably the best thing to do and then finish configuring the uh, grub bootloader so all we do here now we've done the configuration is I'm going to time this we run make, we can put in minus J4. I can't remember if it reads the make flags or not. In fact, we've actually lost the C flags. I don't know if that makes a difference to the kernel. Uh, yeah, they see they're not there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come out of the truth, re-enter it, go back to sources, Linux. Um, and we should have the C flags back now. Like I said, I'm not sure if it does read them or not. I'm not sure if it does read on 
the make flags or not. So uh, let's let's try building without just by running time make. And yeah, I'm not sure. Let's have a look at the other terminal. Run top in it. Uh, looks like it is using that. So it's because we're running make. I guess it's looking at that option. Make make flags option variable. So that's fine. So we'll just wait for this to build. It'll take a few minutes to build, and then we can carry on the rest of the configuration.
Right, so that kernel's built successfully. And we can install the modules now. Which are going to go into um, the system. Let me just check that we've got the boot, the boot directory. There's no separate boot directory, so it's going on the root. Let's install the modules. And it says there about uh, if you've got a separate boot directory to mount it in the host system. Now we're going to copy the kernel image file into the boot directory and rename it. Likewise the system map and we'll keep a copy of the config file as well. And there's some documentation to install for this kernel. There's just some information there about if you're keeping the kernel tree to change it to the Linux user, the root user, sorry. So let's do that because you may want to keep it in case you need to make any modifications to the existing kernel. Um, there's something there about changing Linux module load order if you need certain things to load in a particular way. Um, that might be uh, the opposite of what the automatic loading uh, achieves then to create this file here. Um, I guess we could install this directory here but apart from that I'm not going to make any other changes. So the next bit is using grub to set up the boot process but remember this is not using the UEFI so we'll ignore this this part and we're going to go back to the um, grub setup in the beyond Linux from scratch uh, book so it says the next thing you need to do so if you remember we've configured the kernel we've built the kernel we've installed the kernel the next thing we need to do to, to finish the EFI installation is to find the or create the EFI system partition. So if you remember, we've already got an EFI partition because the Apple um, uses uh, its own customized version of EFI. It's kind of a, as I say, I think it's a, I wouldn't call it a hybrid. It's a mishmash of version one and version two from what I've read. Um, so it kind of works, but not quite in the way we expect it. Um, it says there, if the hard drive is new or if it's the first time the UEFI has been installed on the system um, so you need to format the uh, partition as a VFAT file system um, and it says to see the instructions above. We don't need to do that because it already exists. Um, so what we need to do next is to do these commands here. Now these are perfectly valid for our system. Although we're in a true environment these will work, these commands will work. So let's do that and you can see it's mounted the system EFI in the boot directory. So if I do a listing of boots you'll see there's the EFI directory that was just created and within that um, oh right, okay, it's not actually mounted it. ST1. Right, I wonder if these need to be done outside of the truth in that case. Yeah, it's it should have something on that. Uh, I'm slightly worried why that's empty. Now this could be the way that the Apple works is why there's not um, in the past when I've done this I've upgraded from various previous versions of the Mac OS 
and there's been a an Apple firmware file there, um, and it's not actually there, so I'm a little bit concerned about that, whether this is going to work or not. It should work, um, but we'll have to see. Um, I'm just going to run a command. This if I boot manager command is the one that I'm hoping to save my skin. I was not supported in this system. Okay, that's because we need to mount some. Yeah, this next bit. Um, well, let's carry on for the moment. We need to add this command in, or this line to the FS tab. So let's add that in. Let's view that. You can see it's added in this line here. So let's tidy this up, delete that line, and paste it in here, for example. And I'll just tidy up the layout of this as well. Given that's got an FSCK order, I'm actually going to move that. So just after the root. So that's okay. Um, now we're going to mount the EFIVR's system directory and also add this to the FS tab. So let's go back and tidy that up as well. Now, for some reason, Vi doesn't like this EFIVAR's name. It comes up in red, but um, this does work. So that's not a problem. So I'm just going to move this inside the comments to, so they make a bit more sense. And once again, just adjust the layout of this. Default zero. That's about the best we can do. Uh, so if I do the EFI boot manager again, it should work now. Yes, you can see, I'll be referring to these again. For some reason, the Mac OS installs two boot entries into the EFI variables. Um, and you can see the boot order, it's going to boot the one that's numbered 80. So I don't know what the other one's for, but it's always... 0080 that it boots and we're actually going to be adding that to that one as well um, there was something that did change with the firmware in this latest version which um, kind of changed things a bit I wonder if this is the big change that there's no actual firmware file in the EFI directory anymore uh, so we'll just have to see whether this works or not. Anyway, if we run this command here, this should install a um, bit of firmware in the AFI directory for LFS. So let's run that, and it's worked. And let's look at the boot AFI directory again. And you can now see we've got a, another directory in there called AFI in capitals, and that's because obviously this is a VFAT file system. It has no knowledge of lowercase. Um, and also under that you can see there's an LFS entry. And within that is a grub x64.efi, which is the binary that um, is going to be used to boot um, the uh, LFS system. Uh, the reason why I was a bit shocked is because under the EFI I expect to see Apple and then under that there's some files and directories under there. Um, so like I say, obviously Big Sur boots in a different way. That may be something to do with the fact that it's the first operating system that's compatible with their new M1 chip. Um, so it could be that they're changing the way the machines boot because they could move into different architecture. But anyway, with this command works. As you can see, it says uh, this is the output and this is what we did get. So that's fine. Um, let's run the EFI boot manager again and you'll see that we've now got an additional entry called 
uh, boot 0000 and LFS and you'll also notice that it's added that LFS entry as the first boot order so this would mean that if LFS failed to boot for example it couldn't be found it would then move on to the Mac OS X uh, boot entry and boot that instead now the problem I had I thought oh that's fine if I do something wrong it will just default to another operating system i.e. the Mac operating system but it's not what quite not what quite quite what happened what happened in my case was that it did boot the binary but the binary was incompatible or it did something wrong or the configuration was wrong and as far as the EFI is concerned it's booted okay because it's handed off the boot sequence to the LFS um, uh, EFI program the EFI binary this binary here and uh, so that that was all it knew it, it was as far as the uh, firmware inside the Mac was concerned the boot was successful um, and that's where I came unstuck and as I, say, I couldn't get any of the keyboard shortcuts to work where I was holding down the alt option button that didn't seem to work and that's the point where I had to um, resort to removing the disk and wiping it just to false the fact that when the the firmware in the Mac went to look for the LFS binary that it wasn't there and then it knew it had to default back to something else so it was a bit of a um, excessive thing to do but it's the only way I could find to get the system back and working working apart from that it was just broken so what I decided to do I looked into this EFI boot manager being as it was called a boot manager and found that you obviously you might guess you can change the order of the boot sequence so what I'm going to do is to do that initially um, so if I type um, sorry if I boot manager is it minus H I think it is for help you can see there's this list of um, commands here which you can um, feed into EFI boot manager to control how it boots and what I want to do is to alter the sequence. So I actually want to put this back to how it was. Either have the boot order as 0080 as it was before, or 0080, 0,000, for example. So I'm just going to have it as 0080 so that it only boots the Mac operating system. And you'll see why in a moment. So to do that, um, I need to. Uh, which one is it I need? Boot order, yeah, it's this one here. Minus O. Type of minus O. And then the four digit numbers that I want to have in the boot order. So I just want 80, so 0080. Press enter. And you can see the boot order's now changed. So I've, I've actually deleted the boot, boot entry for LFS, or the boot order for LFS. The entry's still there to boot, but there's no way of booting it except for another command which is called uh, where is it gone uh, boot next this one here so this is quite clever because what this will do is I'll use this minus n to tell it that I want to boot the LFS system next so minus n zero 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 and you can see now it's added a new line here called boot next and that means that on the next reboot, it will boot this partition, uh, this system here. But after it's done that boot, it will revert back to the uh, boot order sequence. And because LFS is not in there, it won't boot LFS next time. So it can be a little bit inconvenient in that if it doesn't boot, um, we can't get into LFS to set up the next boot again. We have to boot from the USB stick to configure the next boot. But it does mean that if there's anything wrong with the LFS, that we're at least going to boot back to the Mac and, and get some sort of sane system up and running. So this is my little bit of uh, protection, my insurance, for ensuring that I don't, uh, well, I wouldn't say brick the machine, but certainly lock myself out of being able to make any adjustments to the boot order or indeed to what is preventing the boot, the booting from occurring. So as it stands, you can see that the boot next will boot 000. 000 is LFS, that's what we want for the moment. 
so I can carry on with the configuration and I need to copy this configuration in now and what that's done is created a file called grub config in a directory called grub under the boot so I'm going to edit that now and just check that everything's what I expect it to be in here um, now the first thing I need to change is the root partition the root partition is not SDA2 because that's the Apple Mac partition so I need to change this to 3 because that's my real um, boot partition uh, sorry root partition uh, you'll notice I've also added a, a menu entry for getting into the firmware setup it's kind of a moot point really because there is no firmware set up as I say on the Mac you can't press F2 or delete or anything um, unless there's a hidden option that I'm not aware of uh, and that's the problem I had because I had a system an LFS system that wasn't booting correctly there was no way of pressing a key combination on the keyboard to get into a menu uh, that's in like the BIOS of firmware like you would get with a normal um, PC based motherboard um, and that's the problem I had so this this you could actually delete I mean I'll leave it there you can try it all you'll get is a blank screen and it just hangs there it doesn't do anything so it just goes to show that the EFI implementation on the Mac is different it's not complete effectively um, but yeah for now I'll leave that there so I'll save that Um, from Grub's perspective right okay so oh yes that's yes that's quite important of course because we've got the boot partition on the root partition it's important to leave this boot prefix here if I had had a separate boot partition then I would have to delete this forward slash boot and this root would still point to the real root um, so for example if the boot partition was SDA2 then I'd remove that part of this uh, boot line but this root would still point to SDA3 which would be the real root but in the example I'm doing here there is no separate boot partition so I do need to leave that in otherwise it won't be able to find the kernel uh, image which is what this file is here dual booting, booting with Windows obviously we're not doing that but they've, they're now giving instructions on how that can be achieved so that's quite useful um, when I initially started this uh, investigating this it was before the APFS file system was being used in Mac uh, when it was still HPFS um, and Linux can boot from HPFS plus but it can't boot from APFS yet so um, I could add in another menu entry uh, if I can find it but it's going to be pointless really um, unless you've got an older version where you're still using HPFS um, it's there's not much point to it really um, yeah that, in fact I don't think I'll bother if if anybody does need to know how to add an entry for that you can't find it on the on the web then I can add that in um, maybe to the, the comments for this or the notes for this video but um, yeah, it's and, and especially also come to think of it, the the idea of this is that to get rid of the um, Mac OS completely and just be running on Linux from scratch. So yeah, that's another reason why I'm not going to add it in. So that's it for the um, EFI part of the Beyond the Linux from scratch. We don't need that anymore. Well, I will lead it up in case we have problems, but. Um, in fact, no, there's no point because we're on a live CD or live image, so there's no point in that. Uh, so let's move on now.